Uh, introduce our next speaker, Jeff Olds. Jeff is uh, uh, with Apache Data Systems. He's a senior systems engineer. Uh, Jeff has had a long history working in the IT industry uh, and in fact has spent a considerable amount of time in the Middle East uh, and that's an area where he's built up very, very specific industry expertise in the oil and gas industry. So he's a, he's a real expert in that and a very good generalist across high performance computing and storage systems for research requirements, both universities as well as the corporate sector and government. So Jeff is going to talk on avoiding the very dark age. Thank you, Jack. Good morning. Um, it's, it's a strange title, I guess, avoiding the digital dark age. Um, it's, it's really about how do we avoid losing data. Uh, in the past, it's, it's been relatively easy to maintain a record of, uh, you know, 100 uh, megabytes of data, 100 gigabytes of data, a terabyte of data. But how do you keep 40 petabytes of data? How do you look after 40 petabytes of data and avoid losing data? So it's, a, it's more about that. So uh, this is a slide from 2008. It's uh, the data that's been stored by GenBank. And uh, it's, uh, I'm not going to go into in, in detail about that, but it's an amazing, the phenomenal growth of data since the, uh, probably difficult to see, but in the early, in the late 90s here, the growth of data was driven by the uh, access to cheap compute. Um, but at that stage, we would, it, the data was growing at about two times every 18 months. That's in 2008. Things have changed dramatically since then. Uh, genome, genome sequences are producing phenomenal amounts of data and data is growing at even a much faster rate than that today. So we need to store this data, we need to look after this data, we need to um, be able to use that data. So how customers are asking questions like, how do I manage this sort of data? What do I, how do I manage the growth? How do I manage, how do I protect it? How do I look after this data and preserve the content? And how do I derive value from it? How do I uh, ask, you know, search for the data I need and find the data I need. Excuse me. Uh, everybody should turn their phones off. <laughs> Sorry about that. My apologies. That was just a reminder to come up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was a 15 minute reminder. <laughs> turn that off. No, it won't turn off, of course. So, okay, um, yeah, so, and even though you get, you have that data, you know, what data should you keep? What data shouldn't you keep? How do you meet your regulatory requirements in keeping that data? So in 2007, the uh, Storage uh, Network Industry uh, Association uh, did an, an, a, an a survey on 100 year archive requirements. And they came up with four key ways of losing digital data and the two grand technical challenges. So I'm just going to go through these. Uh, the first uh, way of losing the data is they cannot read it. So you might write your data to tape. The tape could be corrupted. The uh, oxide layer could be flaking. Um, you can't find the device to read that tape anymore. All, right? All sorts of ways you cannot read that data. Uh, even if you can read it, can you interpret it? Right, so is it an old QIC 150 or a tech, you know, a TK50 cartridge? Can you get the can you get the uh, the device to read that anymore? If you can interpret it, can you validate that it's authentic? Is this the original data? Has it not been modified by somebody? Has it not been modified by, uh, you know, somebody or the tape been rewritten or some issues about the data? Um, can you find it? Now, this could be a number of things. Uh, can you not find it, the, the media itself or can you not search for the data for some reason? You know that it's there in that four petabytes of data, but you need that 100 kilobyte file. Can you find it? The techni technical challenges they came up with was uh, twofold. One was the physical migration. So the challenge is with, uh, with, your, with this data is that, or with keeping data, is that over the long term, you need to migrate to different platforms. The cost of maintaining data on an old uh, technology can become prohibitive with maintenance. You've got to maintain the drives, you've got to look after the, the, the devices, you've got to keep checking that, the, that the, the media is valid. So 
Typically, technology change is about every three to five years. New technology, denser technology, cheaper technology, and so you need to migrate that. Now, that's not a challenge if you've got you know, 100 terabytes or 20 terabytes, but it becomes a challenge when there's 50 petabytes. And the other one was logical migration. This is a bit more, even, even more challenging because uh, the file that you wrote in 1989 to Excel that you want to read in 2025 version of Excel may not be able to read. So you need to read your data back in, change its format at some, some instance, and keep doing that regularly so that you just keep up with the current format. Just running through a couple of examples of uh, in, over what history has told us. So the Faceos disk is a uh, is a clay or stone tablet that was is believed to be uh, 3,500 years old. It was found about 100 years ago, and it's very readable. As you can, you can even see the symbols there. They're quite clear. They can be scanned to a computer, you know, uh, sketched, whatever. Quite readable, but it's undecipherable. Nobody knows the language anymore that it was written in. So uh, there's been many interpretations of it. It's, uh, uh, one of them is that it's a, um, a plane, you know, a, a game board. One is um, uh, that it's uh, a list of assets from a temple. Another one is that it's a prayer. And some esoteric, rather esoteric interpretations is that it's an extraterrestrial message. So you know, it's fine to be able to read that data, but interpreting it is a challenge. One more recent, uh, everybody knows that picture, I assume. Um, NASA had designed, or had designed for them, special slow scan cameras to film the uh, Apollo 11 landing on the moon. And uh, in order to get the data back to Earth in time for, uh, to, for broadcast so that around the world that people could watch this happen. The scan conversion, unfortunately, uh, created quite a lot of artifacts in the, in the footage, but today, uh, the, the, the three, sorry, the three tele telemetry stations that, it, that received that data from the slow scan cameras wrote it to specific tapes. Those tapes were sent into archive, 15 of them, 15 from each, each station, that's 45 tapes, and they were never seen again. So unfortunately the, the, the uh, clear footage is not available any longer. What they believe happened is that in the 1980s there was a critical shortage of, of tape. There was a, a change in manufacture and the oxide was flaking. So uh, they recalled a lot of tapes from archive uh, and they believe a lot of Landsat tapes and they believe that the Apollo 11 footage ended up in that and was degaussed. So very easy to lose footage, very easy to lose, date, lose data. NASA is still maintaining the only drives in the world today that can read that tape in the vain hope that the footage will be found. So, the compelling reason to act. The longer we put this problem off, the worse it gets. The problem just gets bigger and bigger. So we need to be able to read the data, decipher the data, we need to make sure it's authentic. All those questions need to be answered. So, how do we avoid the digital dark age? Well, we suggest that you use Hitachi's object storage, <laughs> quite naturally. <laughs> So what is Hitachi's object storage? Uh, it's called Hitachi Content Platform and it forms part of our file and content solutions. So over on this side of the slide here, we have uh, Hitachi's uh, high-speed NAS solutions and they, auto Oops, I'm sorry. they automatically tier into Hitachi's content platform on policy basis. So uh, the content platform will protect the data mm -hmm and does not need to be backed up. It's a highly redundant platform that does not need to be backed up. And it is designed to, hand, to store data and keep data for very, very long term. Medical images, for medical data, for example, has to be kept today for the life of the patient. So uh, HCP is used by uh, Queensland Health to uh, keep patient records. <laughs> and we'll, as we'll see, as we move forward, we'll see how it can match, meet some of those challenges and uh, solve the solution, solve the problems. We also have uh, a, uh, a discovery suite, which is a federated search that will allow you to uh, search for data across your NAS solution, Atashi high-speed NAS solution, content platform, and third-party NAS solutions. So 
I, I don't want to go through all of these given the time frame we've got. I don't want to go through all of the features of, of uh, Tasha Content Platform, but they are many and varied. Uh, deduplication, uh, replication uh, from uh, ge geographic dispersed sites, local replication, uh, many to one, one to many. It's a HA architecture, and it's uh, the, the when we ingest an object into into a Content Platform, it is inviolate, so it cannot be changed. We take a hash of that ingested object <coughs> and its associated metadata, including custom metadata, and we compare, we continually compare that object against that hash. So the, the, pro, the, the internal workings of HCP will always validate that that object has not been changed. If it does get changed somehow through corruption or something else, then it will heal that object. So it is a self-healing uh, architecture. And of course, it is uh, it is scalable in uh, performance and and uh, capacity. Uh, at the present time, it will support in its own right. One instance will support 40 petabytes. But as we grow in capacity of, of drives and uh, and future archive uh, technology, that capacity will, will go way out to hundreds of petabytes. So if we just look at uh, a typical life cycle of some research data. So you might be looking at three tiers of storage, and uh, as the research data is created and uh, processed, it might spend some time up in tier one, in tier two, and it might then go into tier three, while it might get accessed occasionally over the next uh, short period of time, over the next few years, might get accessed occasionally to verify the data or to review the data or to, to uh, read that uh, re research paper and check it. Then it might go dark for a while until sometime later when somebody else wants to extend that research or the data will move back up into tier one while it's been processed and worked on again, then it may go dark again. Over that time, there will be a number of tech refreshes that will be required. So, you know, as we said earlier on, <coughs> earlier on, technology changes. It doesn't stand still. And we can't predict today what technology will be there tomorrow. And if you maintain the same technology, the maintenance will, you know, will one day hurt you. And new product, new, there's new, uh, new technology coming all the time. Denser technologies, cheaper technologies, more economical, more ecologically uh, safe. So how do we uh, deal with that? So up here we'll see uh, Tashi's content platform or content storage, uh, object storage platform, which consists of a multiple of redundant servers accessing some storage here. So now we buy a new platform, a new set of storage, doesn't matter what it is, uh, could be anything. And uh, so initially object, the, the HCP will copy new objects to the new storage and then you can tell, thank you Jay, then you can tell the uh, object storage to migrate the existing data to the new platform. So it will automatically do that. You do not have to be involved. You do not have to have a team of people involved in this migration. You do not have to uh, understand what the data is. The platform understands what the data is. The objects are intelligent. It will move the objects to the new storage automatically. Then you can decommission the old platform. You can have multiple platforms under object storage. You don't have to rely on one set of storage. You can have multiple systems as well. So what about um, data migration between tiers? So you, your data might start off in the high-speed NAS in some SSD or some high-speed SAS drives, and automatically, under a policy basis, it will, we can migrate into a Tashi content platform. And the key here is that the content platform does not need to be backed up. So the only thing, provided, of course, that you have a, a off-site replication. You, know, you can't prove the machine, proof the machine against site failure. So. Uh, the only thing that needs to be backed up is your high-speed NAS. So your active data is the only data that needs to be backed up and, and, and maintained. Then, of course, at, after, you know, disk is, is, is still expensive to keep long-term data in. So what we do then is we use spin-down disk. So we can create, we can create LUNs or, or um, sorry, RAID groups or sets of disks or a whole array as a spin-down volume. So the, Basically, we, we put the data there, the dark data goes there, and it spins down, and there's no cost from a point of view of power consumption. 
we support uh, intelligent movement of the data from all these tiers and backwards and, backwards and forwards as required. The next step is that we will, we will also migrate to what's called next-gen media. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you what that is today um, because we really don't know. However, we do, will support transparent migration to that data. And of course, we allow full content and metadata search across that. Content and metadata search. What I can tell you about what Atashi is doing is that in September this year, I don't know if, you've, uh, if you noticed this in the press, but we announced that we can store data in glass. So we are storing, we are using a laser to burn dots in glass. Uh, this small little piece of glass here can support, with four layers of dots, will support 40 megabytes of data. Why burning dots in glass? Because we can read it with an optical microscope. We do not need anything special, any special device, any special machine that to read that data. We just need an optical microscope and the dots and then a piece of software to say, okay, this is a binary language and how to, you know, what that language is. All right, so it doesn't need any special uh, tape reader or disk reader or anything like that to read that. And it's proof to just about anything. It's burned on quartz glass, so it's uh, the same stuff they use in, in labs. Uh, for beakers and things like that, so it can stand to 1,000 degrees for up to two hours. Uh, it's impervious to EMP and electromagnetic uh, things like that. So it's a, it's a good way to store long-term data, but data that doesn't change. So uh, Tashi is talking at the moment to the, to the Japanese government about the practical uses of this, but this is the, uh, probably the precursor of things to come. Okay. So I would just like to um, end with inviting you to come and see, see us at the stand. Uh, you can scan this QR code and uh, the opportunity to win a hundred, uh, sorry, one terabyte uh, disk. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, and I also invite you to, uh, to Peter, uh, Dr. Peter, uh, sorry, Dr. James Reaney's uh, speech uh, tomorrow midday. He'll be talking about the explosion in data research and uh, how you manage that data as well. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, have we got time for questions, Jack? Question. Any, uh, plenty of time for questions, so if anyone has questions. If you could use the microphone, put you on permanent record forever. <laughs> I haven't noticed any, any tape devices in your system, is it? Any Correct. Particular... <laughs> there is a reason for that, and the tape will not deliver the service level that HCP requires. We need to make sure that the data is valid and is authentic, so it means we have to process that data regularly against the checksum to ensure that the data is authentic. So tape will not deliver the, the service level that uh, HCP requires. So there is no tape in that solution. It doesn't mean we can't tier to tape. Uh, well, you can definitely tier to tape, but not through HCP. Because HCP guarantees data authenticity, it guarantees data availability, and unfortunately tape does not deliver that service level. I have a question for you. Sure, yes. This is perhaps a silly question, but the glass, the glass stored. Yes. Can you actually feel with your finger the indentation? No, they're inside the glass. Inside the glass. Yes, inside the glass. Yeah, so they're, uh, it's, you can't even see it. You know, it looks like it's clear glass to you, but it is, is, is dots burnt inside the glass, four layers in that for 40 megabytes. And there's no reason, they said there's no reason why we can't burn more layers. Yeah, I, I, it's in early days in that technology. Uh, that's basically about one audio CD's worth. Um, that glass piece is pretty small, but uh, it's only four dots. There's no reason why they can't burn more in, in, in depth and, of course, make the glass bigger. The, of course, but the, the bigger the glass is, the, the bigger the chance it will break. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I can... So the, the other media I talked about, that we were talking about, uh, is 90% chance going to be optical. That's about all I can say about it. Yeah. A lot more to come. Keep in touch. And thank yep. you very, very much. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.